Buenos días. Hola. Yo no hablo bien español, entonces voy a hablar en inglés. Tengo mi español de México. Es un español de México. Pienso que se entiende un poquito, ¿sí? Sí. Ok, pero antes, um, can we stand up? To move a little bit our body. Yes. And you turn to your right. To your right, yes. Ok. You put your hands, pone las manos en las espaldas de su vecino y un pequeñito masaje. Sí, por favor. Sí. Para se sentir bien, para empezar el día. Sí. Muy profundo. Ah, sí. Mm. Muy bien. Ok, otro lado. Otro lado, sí. Y otra persona, otro vecino. Otra vecina. Sí. Oh. Es una ocasión de respirar. De, sí. Mm. Mm. Ok. Siéntate. <risa> Gracias, muchas gracias. Yo voy a hablar en inglés, me, dis me disculpen ustedes. Um, I, I feel very, very happy and very honored to, uh, to do the closing um, of, this, of this wonderful tour. And also, another reason why I feel so happy to, to come here in Madrid, I met a very, very old friend. I haven't seen him for 26 years. His name, Angel, and we, we just met, we connected again yesterday, and I would like to just uh, share that joy with you, Angel. Ven aquí, sí, es un amigo. Okay, gracias. Okay. Well, you know what? We used to do stunts together. Cascada es, es, es un especialista. ¿Tiene un micrófono aquí? ¿Por qué? Vais a decirlo en gel. Uf. Hola. Bueno, yo soy Ángel Plana, soy especialista de cine. Eh, a él le conocí hace 28 años en París, cuando nadie de vosotros todavía sabía de él. Bueno, ahí teníamos seis o siete <risa> cuando nos conocimos. Y estuvimos en la escuela de especialistas. Entonces, yo ahora tengo aquí una escuela de especialistas, yo he tirado por otro camino, él por otro, y eh, ha contactado conmigo después de 26 años que no nos veíamos y veo que sigue totalmente en forma. Es para mí también un ejemplo a seguir. Ayer estuvo en un rodaje conmigo y hoy estoy en su exposición con él y hemos intercambiado muchas experiencias entre ellas. La bienvenida que se dan los especialistas, que es con tres puñetazos en el estómago. <risa> gracias, muchas gracias. Collective intelligence. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I will not repeat today the the first conference that I gave in in Brussels because you can see it online. And also, I would like to move on. However, I would like to do like a 10 minutes um, cover of this conference, like a summary, so that we can uh, we can move on. First, I started to explain what collective intelligence means. It means two things. First a property of life. You don't have life without collective intelligence. Our cells, they collaborate together in a collective intelligence way. Our brain has billions of cells, and you don't have a CEO at the top, but itself organizes itself in an emergent way to produce someone called a human being. Ants, ant colony, flocks of birds, uh, sports team, This very room here, we all exist because of collective intelligence. No life can exist without collective intelligence. So first, we can see collective intelligence as a property of life, of social living. Second, it has turned into a science, a new discipline. You know, the internet arrives, and it, it really gives us a new opportunity. It gives humanity a new opportunity to self-organize itself in a very different way, like never before, like never in nature before. So, no, you know, it, it's, it tells us the reason why collective intelligence has become 
as science, maybe the science for today, um, because of the rise of the internet and all the uh, technologies coming with it. And I will speak a little bit more about it. But first, I would like to cover very quickly what we call the four main forms of collective intelligence, so that you get an idea, and then we will move forward, we will move beyond, uh, so we can uh, really explore new topics. So the first form, um, and that I shared uh, in Belgium, in Brussels, we call it swarm collective intelligence. Swarm collective intelligence because you have a high number of individuals doing something together, a flock of birds, uh, a school of fish, as you can see, social insects, ant colonies, big herds when you have thousands and thousands of animals running together. You can call it swarm collective intelligence. At the individual level, you don't have much freedom. But at the collective level, you may have a very, very smart level, like an ant colony. And in humanity, uh, you know, humankind does not exactly live by this kind of collective intelligence. However, we have circumstances where we can experience swarm collective intelligence. For instance, here you have the New York Marathon. You have tens of thousands of people running together. You can't do many things when you, you run. You just follow the move. However, at a collective level, you have something very interesting to observe. And probably some of you have experienced this this morning. <laughs> Rings a bell? Okay, well, same thing. You know, in our car, we may feel very frustrated because we don't have lots of move. However, at a collective level, it can fill in a whole city and empty it every day. Try to organize that. So you see, maybe at the individual level, you may not have much freedom, but at the collective level, you may have very interesting emergent, emergent properties. First form of collective intelligence, and probably the oldest form that we know. Then comes humankind, with a second form of collective intelligence that I call original collective intelligence. Original because we come from this as a species, we come from that. Uh, the opposite of swarm collective intelligence, a small group, but with highly individualized people. People or monkey, uh, monkeys or elephants or dolphins, some birds, some animals live by this kind of uh, collective intelligence. Highly individualized. And if we take it at the human level, you can observe this picture. And all these pictures, you, you will see them in the previous conference, so hence the reason why I go fast. But you can see in uh, this picture, this uh, jazz band, you can see super individualized people. They, they know what to do. They have a specialty, a music instrument, or they could play the ball. And at the same time, they have a connection to one another. You can see, you can see that on the picture. You can see that the pianist has a connection with uh, the guy uh, at the drums and so on, and the singer. But at the collective level, you have a very, very important property that we call holopticism. Holopticism. Holos, the whole, and opticism, to see the whole. That means because of their training, the musicians, not only they, s they play well the, the music instrument, but also they have this perception of the whole, therefore they know what to do. They don't need a chain of command, they don't need a boss. They may have leadership, the leadership may change from one player to another, but I make a difference between authority in the chain of command and leadership. And you can really see that here in this context. Now, this second form of collective intelligence has two limitations. The first limitation, it works only with a small number of people. If you have 100 people, what happens here in music? How do we do with the 100 people? We do the... Symphonic orchestra, okay? It moves to another kind of structure, another kind of collective intelligence, okay? So, first limit the, the number, and second limit the distance. That means the people need to really connect with one another. A group of wolves, for instance, if they hunt, they, all see, uh, they can hunt and coordinate because they keep connected with one another. They can see each other, they can hear each other. Therefore, they can operate and hunt in the context of original collective intelligence. Same thing for lions, you know, big cats, and so on. Okay, dolphins as well, and so on. 
So humanity evolved because humanity needed to make big civilizations. And it did that by moving to the next form of collective intelligence, the third one, that we call pyramidal, pyramidal collective intelligence. Because you have someone at the top, and the first civilizations always had some kind of living god at the top. It doesn't matter whether we talk about the Chinese, the Egyptians, the Maya, um, the Mesopotamian civilizations. You had all these societies coming up with someone at the top, then castes, different you know, social classes, like at the second level, you would have the priests and the noble, and then you would have the merchants, the traders, and then uh, next level you would have the people of the land, the farmers, um, and then you would have what we call the unskilled workers, the slaves, the untouchables, and so on. Okay? And of course, I show here the first form first forms of pyramidal collective intelligence, but we, s we still live by these standards. If I show a simplified design, a social design of uh, pyramidal collective intelligence, then you can see that it works still like a pyramid with um, groups of original collective intelligence working with one another in a chain of command. So at the top, you may have the executive, you know, executive group, people making decisions for the company, for instance, or the president and the ministries in the government. And then you would have the departments or the ministries in a state. And then you have services and so on. And it works the very same way in churches, armies, companies, states, and so on. Anything big today, we have not known any or not found any other way to deal with big organizations. And last conferences, the first conference I gave, I gave more details about that. So again, I invite you to, to go and, and look at this. That will give you much more clues about how it works and also its limitations. Because like original collective intelligence, pyramidal collective intelligence has worked for thousands of years. And now it reached an end. This kind of collective intelligence can hardly cope with complexity, with very fast change. It has you know, hard-coded structures. It cannot recombine in real time. Also, because it has chains of command, and that will speak more specifically to, to you in the coaching part, a chain of command means that you have predictable people. It means that they have this training to become predictable by saying, OK, this next Monday, no matter how I feel, no matter my inner state, I will come and do my, my work. It takes 20 years or 15 years, 10 years, doesn't matter, of training for a kid, a five years old kid, kid, completely unpredictable, to turn into someone who can sit for hours and listen and separate himself from himself. Therefore, pyramidal collective intelligence produces amazing human beings in the doing, super developed, and very underdeveloped in the being, in the knowing of themselves. Because pyramidal collective intelligence needs mostly predictable people. It takes a lot and a lot of education to, to do that. So it, you see it has some limitations, and I won't cover all of them, but in the end, today, we can all experience directly, especially you coaches, if you work in, in the corporate world, that people more and more suffer from that separation between their being and their doing. And if you want to reconcile that, then someday or another, it will question whether they keep working in this kind of environment because of the design. You may have very well-intentioned people there, but because of the design, then it has some limitations. And that creates the fourth form of collective intelligence. The fourth form that we call holomidal, holomidal collective intelligence. It still has the root holistic, holos, holomidal collective intelligence. This collective intelligence that we see emerging through the internet, distributed, decentralized, just like our, our brain cells, our brain, or what we call also the rhizome under the forests, you know, all these connections between the roots and the mushrooms and all the animals moving from one place to another and all the chemicals that happen in the forests. It looks very much like a brain. So, holomidal collective intelligence operates like a brain in an emergent way, you have leadership, 
you have more and more distributed power. Soon we will see also more and more distribu uh, distributed uh, production as well, see the 3D printers and so on. It also involves the, the conquering of the individuation again, back to individuation. That means these collectives can only work, like in the jazz band, with some kind of augmented holopticism. That means, as a player here, if, if I represent one of the dots here in this collective, I know what everyone else does. And if I know what everyone else does, if I know the emergent property, then I know what to do. I don't necessarily need a chief or a boss. I will need some leadership. I may listen to that person who invites me to do such and such things. We need those, those kinds of things. Chains, uh, chains of value or chains of um, action and so on and so on. So you can find lots and lots of things about holomidal collective intelligence on the internet from 3D, 3D printers to what we call social wear, community wear. That means all these forms of software and code that goes on the internet and that allows collectives to self-organize, to make their own decisions to build a collective memory, to build trust, to see one another, to know what everyone does, to uh, follow and deal with, very, with complexity, to deal with, to deal with conflicts, to create uh, new things. So social wear, community wear, online does this kind of thing. And you can read, of course, tons and tons of things, and so I don't want to spend too much time today on this part of holomidal collective intelligence. I would like to move on. And I would like to start from the question that I asked last time at the last conference, which I will uh, repeat here. You see, um, we have grown, grown up in the world of original collective intelligence, like the family, or a startup, our sports team, our classroom, all this works in original collective intelligence. And we have also grown up and, and learned how to operate in pyramidal collective intelligence. We know the codes for that. We know the, the language. We know how, to, uh, how a big company operates. We know how the states, the government, society in the streets, a city, all these things operate through pyramidal collective intelligence standards. So we know how to do that. But we don't have the keys, we don't have the codes for the next form for holomidal collective intelligence. So I would like to explore this question, and I ended last conference with this question. How can we evolve? How can we transition to the next form if we want to evolve? I don't say everyone should do that, but if you want, if you question yourself about evolving, then how can you, as an individual, and also your organization, how can it evolve towards this next form of collective intelligence? And you can ask this question yourself at a personal level, but also as a coach. If you have the, the job of a coach, you may have learned how to coach people in original collective intelligence context and also in big corporations in pyramidal collective intelligence context. Maybe also coaches have a new opportunity to explore how they can help organizations and people to transition themselves in this new world and this holomidal collective intelligence. However, that requires that you, as persons, have learned that before, of course. And that really leads now to, to the very flesh of what I would like to, to share today. And we can really see that as a, a new universe. A new universe means that, okay, we look at the stars, we know we have new planets, new, you know, new lands, new whatever, new universes there where we, where we may want to go. And no matter what it takes, we will need to train astronauts. Today, in other planets and other stars, only astronauts can do that. Well, maybe today, in these new forms of collective intelligence, in this new kind of humanity, only humanonauts can do that. Not everyone. Maybe someday everyone can go to the moon or to Mars. You know, in the past, not everyone could go from one continent to another. You needed to, to become a, a sail person in a sailboat, okay? And now today, everyone can do it. Now today, only astronauts can go to this place, 
to the to the stars, to the to the planets, and the need to train. So I would like to raise that, the same question for humanonauts. That means people who will hack themselves, who will prepare themselves, who will get a specific training, so they can really go and explore this new world. We know some truths about this new world, a few truths, which I would like to share with you, but also lots and lots of uh, things remain unknown. And so we, just, we have the full freedom to invent ourselves, how we will go in this new, in this new world. So I don't come with answers. No one has answers, but I would say I come as a humanonaut. That means, uh, that means as someone, someone who trains. I train very hard, 24-7, to see how I can live in this, in this new world. And I would like to share some examples of what it, it takes for me as a training to, to practice this evolution. And again, I, don't, I will not, never pretend that everyone should do that. I don't come with the solution. I will just come with what I have learned as a person as possibilities, but everyone can choose different paths, different ways to, to do it, and I always feel super happy when, I, when we can share those practice, okay? <coughs> so, I would like now to start with some big domains, and I will start with one, the economy. We know that, you know, every day, we make decisions based on money on, you know, earning money, do we have enough money to do this or that? By the way, I, ha I often ask a question to, uh, to CEOs. I ask them, well, in your company, and you can ask this question for yourself, would you come this morning if you had, let's say, 50 million euros on your bank account? And you can ask yourself this question as coaches and as human beings, would I do what I do right now? Would you sit right now in this room? Would you do what you do right now if you had a limited amount of money or access to, to money. Would you do that? And I think this honest question re can really help us see our level of integrity or our level of freedom. How do we see ourselves through, through freedom? And it shows, of course, the power of money. And I would like now to explore that a little bit more through this game. So I will not ask who has played the Monopoly game, but I would like to ask who has not and never played the Monopoly game. <laughs> okay. <laughs> One, two, three, four. I, I count four persons. Okay. So you see a vast majority, we know this, uh, this game. Okay. So when we start the first square, we start at, in, a, in a very um, equalitarian world. We all start equal. We have the same amount of money, the same amount of chance. Now, you know, I roll the dice, and you have a little bit of luck and a little bit of decision-making to do. And then, the more money I make, the more I can invest. The more I can invest, the more I make. The more I make, the more I invest, and so on. So the more money I make, the more money I make. The less money Angel makes, <laughs> the more he will pay me something. Yes. <laughs> okay. So the less money, the less money, the less money, the less money, because you have to pay for to the landlords and so on. So you 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 will observe two exponential curves. One, let's say mine, because I like to make lots of money, right? That goes up in an exponential way, and the, the other players they will just plummet, you know, down to the limbos there because they will lose everything, and in the end the the, the game stops. Who wins? Who wins? Did I win? I did not win, even if I have all the, all the money. Everyone loses. We call it a collective death. In the games theory, we call it collective death because no one can exchange things anymore. And I can't exchange things also with the people. So I may have all my, you know, banknotes, but I will have experience like every other is what we call the Pareto effect. Pareto effect. That means a law of concentration of money. When we play the Monopoly as kids, we don't realize that we experience what we call the Pareto effect. That means the law of condensation of money. The more I have, the more I have. The less I have, the less I have. And so, you know, the money goes into the hands of the few, just because of design, not because of intention, but just because of the rules. When you have a bank or an authority or state, whatever, 
that injects those units, dollars, euros, whatever, then it will condensate. And Pareto, Vilfredo Pareto, wrote these equations that show that this phenomenon has no, doesn't get influenced by external factors, or very little influence. It doesn't matter the, the tax system you have, it doesn't matter the kind of culture you have, where uh, the climate, uh, the religious beliefs, and so on, Pareto effect will happen. And in the end, it leads to this. I may have you know, all the banknotes, but I will remain alone and dead in the economy. So why do I speak about that? What link does it have with collective intelligence? Well, back to the game. Think that you imagine that you want to put around the board the most, w the wisest people you know on Earth, the most enlightened and well-intentioned people on Earth. And all they have to do, you just ask them to play the Monopoly game by the rules. They don't need to operate in a mean way with one another. But they will end up with rich and poor, no matter what, because of the design. The emergence will happen. And here, we have a collective intelligence question. Collective intelligence question means that you may have good intentions at the individual level, but at the collective level, you may have a completely different outcome. And so that leads to also, also a very important question for collective intelligence because money exists as the technology, one of the core technologies for, pyramidal, for the pyramidal world. When you need concentration of power, you would need money. Money provides a wonderful tool for that. But if you want to evolve towards a world with distributed knowledge, distributed wealth, open source, open data, open innovation, then you will see that money, as a technology, doesn't work anymore. And the next world will very, very likely invent post-monetary technologies. So I, 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 remain, I know I remain very theoretical here. However, we can already... Oh, I forgot, there's, a, there's just also to see, you know, cities. Cities, a concentration of wealth. We can see it. The Pareto effect, you see it. Rio de Janeiro here, Caracas, aquí. You just look at a city and the, the way uh, wealth concentrates, and you see the Pareto effect live in front of your eyes. So I'd like now to become more concrete. Does that look concrete? Well, what do we see here? It looks like a little bit naive. You know, the, in English we say the Schmurfs. Como se dice en español? Pitufos. Si. Okay. But you have individuals living in what we call the gift economy. That we know how to do it in original collective intelligence. Original collective intelligence has not invented money. It has, uh, it has always operated in gift economy, in families, in, in sports teams, and so on. Uh, we live in the gift economy naturally. And gift economy has amazing, amazing properties. Um, it has, you, you don't need you know, someone to uh, have reciprocity in front of you. I can give something to someone, and I know that it may come from another person at another time uh, in a different quantity or quality. So, as a system, gift economy offers an amazing, amazing plasticity. But we have never found a way to do it at a large scale. Therefore, pyramidal collective intelligence invented market economies with money. Now, if we want to evolve towards holomidal collective intelligence, we may need to question our habits, our conditioning in the world of money and in the world of market. In order to evolve that, we may learn how to reconnect with the gift economy, for instance. And that, we can now do it at a large scale with the right software. We have tools today to do that. And as individuals, if you want to practice that, you can. I know it because I do it. One of the things that I explore as a humanonaut, I have m shifted my life into a gift economy. I, I don't buy and sell anymore. What I can give, I give. And the clothes I have on me, my, the place where I live, the food I eat, 
and so many other material wealth that I receive, I receive from gratitude. I receive from gifts, from people who want to gift me with this. So it works. And we can do that as a, as a large scale. So that really, um, I wanted to share that as one possible path of investigation that you guys may want to explore in your own life. Because if you do that, not just for idealism, but for exploring the future, for connecting to that practice on a large scale, not just your village, not just your family, but on a large scale, we can do that today. And we can evolve the technologies that enable this possibility at a large scale. First example. Feel okay with that? Not going too fast? Being okay? All right. Another topic. Language. Ah, big one, this one. Language. <laughs> okay. Um, so, in the last conference, I shared the importance, you know, language, one language, you know, Spanish. Spanish has some things that it will never, ever describe. Some things are reality. French has also a part of reality that it will never, ever describe, because it can't. And Chinese has parts of reality that it will never, ever touch or describe, because it can't. And all languages in the world today has a huge part of reality that it will never, ever touch, because it doesn't have words for that, because it doesn't have ontological structures for that. It doesn't have mechanisms to represent this deep, deep, deep level of realities or to represent what our consciousness can experience. So we, we may often experience a gap between what we experience inside, the vastness of the experience we have, but we can build it in a social experience. We can't socialize that. And no conventional language with the tongue can do this. And I like to call it um, ontological jail. That means how we can remain in jail, incarcerated in the old world because of words. And again, we have words that come from original collective intelligence. We have words that come from pyramidal collective intelligence. We have words that come from the past and the present. But what words do we have to describe the next reality? Nothing. Nothing. If we want to get in the next reality, then we have to question our language. If you want to become a humanonaut, that then you will have to evolve your own language. So I did a few, a few things in my life. I shared a first example that I will share very quickly today in the, the last conference. For instance, I don't use the verb to be anymore in English, or le verbe être, the verb être, to be in French, anymore. En español no le puedo. En español hay ser y estar. Es una otra, otra pregunta, ¿sí? But in French and English, of course, with translation, you may not have noticed that. But I don't use this verb, uh, the verb to be anymore. And this way, you can see that again in the conference, but this way I don't impose reality. I don't say things are or are not, and you don't have choices. Uh, I, I can, if I don't use the verb to be, I can reconnect to myself, like rather than saying, um, Angel, no, es, no está aquí. <laughs> Angel está estúpido. Ah. I, can, I can say, or Angel is stupid. I can say, I think, or I have the experience of Angel as a stupid person, or as a clever person, or as a good friend, whatever. I could say, Angel is a good friend. Okay, well, when I say is, I don't leave you choice. You have the isness in it. I don't connect to myself as producing my experience, and I impose your reality as if, ex if it existed like that before me. Okay, so by removing the verb to be, in those two languages, I have solved very important ways to uh, connect to me as a source, as a source of my own manifestation, as a source of my own subjective reality, and not have the illusion that I impose it on others because it exists independently from me. Okay, so you can explore that deeper, but I would like to share another example here in language so I don't repeat the same conference. About three years ago, um, 
I got invited in, in New York uh, at a UN conference, at a UN event, United Nations event. Actually, UNCBD, United Nations Convention for Biological Diversity. And we go in, um, uh, in a meeting room. I stand at the, at the end of the table. On my left, I have corporate people, corporate in the cosmetics and perfume sector. On my right, I have people, uh, primary people, or root people, that mean indigenous people, some coming from, uh, uh, from Australia, aborigines, some coming from uh, Brazil, uh, Mexico, I mean, some different parts of the, wor of the world. Some of them with their traditional um, costume and, uh, and clothing. And this guy had to talk about the, uh, Kyoto, the Kyoto Protocol that says very important things, revenue sharing and prior consent. That means you don't go to these lands and just take what you want and bye-bye, okay, which usually happens, okay? So the Kyoto Protocol stipulates that. Now these guys need to see the practical aspects because in, you know, in uh, cosmetics, they take a lot of re uh, nat natural resources from, from the land and from forests and, uh, and you know, all these uh, natural environments. So these guys need not to go into the practical application of that. And they invited me to try to detect the ontological traps. One guy from the corporate world starts and says, OK, we all agree with the Kyoto Protocol. We want to follow that. You had very well-intentioned people around the, in this room. They really wanted to do well. And the guy says, but it has an amazing complexity, and we cannot anymore follow or apply a good value chain creation. Value chain. I raise my hand. Stop. Value chain. They started to have a conversation about value chain. OK. Well, that means, value chain means that you see the world this way. You have, on one hand, resources. You create added value as a company, and then that goes to the market. That means you force a linear worldview to people. And when you name also resource, the word resource means that in your mind, you consider something as dead and as your disposal, because you call it resource. Just this word disconnects you from the fact that you may have a living system with a systemic connection, with experiences of conscious people or conscious beings. If I say resource, whether I say human resource or just resource, I've lost that thing. And when I say chain of value, that means I, I push a Western concept of, of a linear view of the world. So I stated that with people and I started to realize, wow, yeah, we get into some kind of ontological jail here. We cannot go further, and, and the indigenous people do, do not understand these this concepts, these corporate concepts. So they had a very powerful um, discussion, and in the end, they agreed to speak about wealth circle. Wealth circle. So that means wealth means more than money, but so many things, and circle because we go circular. So I took this example because you see the power of language. Sometimes just using a set of words can keep you completely trapped into the old mindset, into the old world. If you want to think holomidal, if you want to move with the next social ecosystem, you will have to review every single expression that we have in our language. Take resource, for instance. Now, today, when I work in the corporate world, I invite them to really think twice about resource. Do we really need to use this word? Or what, how can we find something else that will shift the culture of the company? OK? Doing well? Shall I move on? OK. Another one, social codes. Ah, a big one, this one, too. No social code exists randomly. They all exist for a reason. The way we shake hands, the way we speak around the table, the way we organize the room here, the way we see, the way we drive, the way we eat, uh, the way we walk in the street, everything belongs to unconscious social code. We don't even think about them because we really live in the matrix of these uh, social codes. So we have social codes for every, everything. Take love, for instance, and I will just also speak a little bit about an ontological uh, trap of love, back to the, to the old thing. We usually say, 
I love you. I love you. You love me. That means I use the verb love as a vector. It has a direction. If I love you, that means I don't love here. It, it already has some scarcity in it. And all the romantic ontology has already built some unconscious forms of scarcity. And we say also, I fall in love, boom. Why don't we rise in love? Why don't we talk about love as a state of consciousness rather than a victorial thing with a direction and all these things? So you see the, the power of ontology here? And now back to, I'd like to go back to social codes connected to love. I have, I have explored something that we call politeness. How could we look at politeness? Well, with experience, by, by studying politeness a lot and a lot and seeing myself trying to behave politely, I realized that when I become polite, then I can avoid truth <coughs> and I can avoid lie. It puts me somewhere in the middle. Politeness provides some kind of social glue so that, you know, for instance, um, truth would say, I have someone, I don't know, with a bad breath in front of me, I say, sorry, I feel bad because you have a bad breath. Truth, okay, not polite, true, okay? Or, <laughs> and, 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 or of course, lying, you know, we, we, try to, we usually lie when we want to save our lives, we want to save our ass, okay? But politeness puts us some kind in those, you know, mid-waters, kind of, you know, mild waters here. Now, you may want to question yourself. We learn this art of politeness. In a world, uh, we, we really need that in a world where people have so much disconnection between the being and the doing. Remember, pyramidal collective intelligence? It really provides lots of social glue in a world where people have a separation with themselves. And it works, and we needed that. If we want to evolve to the next form of consciousness and the next form of social structure, maybe we want to get rid of, of politeness. Maybe we want to learn the art, not of politeness, but the art of truth, of radical truth. And I decided to do that for myself. And that shifted everything in my life. The art of truth, and I say the art of truth because we, you know, truth doesn't mean I will push truth onto someone like, hey, listen to my truth, and I have the truth. No, no, no. It means that I have my truth, and I have it available for people if they want to hear it, to hear what I feel as a truthful person inside myself. I don't know the absolute truth. I only know the truth inside myself, what I experience. And so I can share that. And I, th I think we'll get also a very interesting example with Caitlin later when she speaks about clean questions. It also provides new social codes so that we can also go into a this kind of design or social designs or social agreements that facilitate, that enable the emergence of wisdom, the state of wisdom. So you see, I talk about design here, language, social codes, and like to, I'd like to move on to one last example, uh, food. You know, language exists as a collective thing. It goes through me, and then I reproduce language. Social code, collective tool, it goes through me and I, repro and I reproduce them, therefore I reproduce society. Food, same thing, collective thing, it goes through me, and I perpetuate by eating the food I got given, then I perpetuate it, right? So you see, we can hack ourselves, we can change ourselves, and, this, and decide to see, okay, this kind of language comes to me, I can hack myself so that another kind of language goes out of me. This kind of social codes come to me. I can hack myself and behave with different, different social codes. This kind of food comes to me, and I can ask myself, well, how good does it feel in my body? And also, how well does it serve society and the environment? If I ask myself these two questions, honestly, how, how much good does it do for me? And does it still serve the old economy of extraction, of taking something from someone, or from the land, from animals, or from life, that will just vanish forever? 
if I want to ask this question, like, can I eat so that it serves not just me, but others, other forms of life, then I cannot eat anymore the way we eat. Honestly, it doesn't work. So therefore, let's ask this question. Do we want this world, the industrial world, from pyramidal collective intelligence, as we know it? You see, pyramidal collective intelligence doesn't like diversity. It likes process, because it wants to save money. In order to save money in the scarce world currency, you need to erase a whole ecosystem that has so much diversity in it, but it costs so much to extract this diversity. You better have a very simple resource here that costs less to take. So you erase everything, you burn down everything, and then you have monoculture. Okay? Can we move to something like this, where we integrate with nature, where we have a symbiotic relationship? And I didn't take this uh, drawing uh, randomly. This drawing comes from someone very famous uh, in, in this domain, Luke Schouten, and he really explores those new cities, how we can build them as an engineer. And then we have all these drawings, of course, to start to show how it could work, to have a visual representation of that. But you see, if I want to live in a world like this, then I cannot eat the same food. I will have to change that in myself. I have to hack myself and my habits. Now, to speak about my own decisions, and I don't say everyone should do that, remember that. I eat mostly raw food, organic, raw, vegan. Uh, that means mostly fruits, and I live very, very well. I have a super healthy, healthy life because of this, uh, of this diet. And please, again, I don't say everyone should do that, but I want to stress the importance of hacking ourselves and questioning every single bit of the collectives, of the we that flows through the I, through the self, that we can change. We usually have the habit of seeing, wanting to hack society, to hack, our, uh, to hack outside of us, but I can already hack myself, I can change myself. And so I would like to finish with three core ideas here about this state uh, of existence as a human or not. The first one, um, I can really speak of a, of a spiritual practice here. Spiritual means that through meditation, through meditative practice, through breathing, through changing social codes, through hacking myself, I think uh, I can and we can and everyone can, ch can feel the arrow of evolution, something that pulls us from where we stand now, here and now, and we feel the force, the attraction, each and every one of us. We want to move somewhere, it, and, and it has a direction. It doesn't have a random direction, it has a one direction. An individual one, I don't say everyone does the same step, but listening to ourselves, we can listen to the arrow of evolution. Somewhere in us, we have a fish that wants to go into, onto the land. You know, those fishes that started to go into this toxic atmosphere, very toxic, and then they start, start to stay a little longer there and a little longer, and then they start walking there, and later on they have legs and so on, and we know the rest of the story. So every being, and I think us humans included, of course, we do have this arrow of evolution, something that wants to put, to put us into motion. Let's listen to that. The second thing also, we tend to hear about the future as something falling our head, on our head, you know, 3D printers coming, social media, and post-human future, and genetics, and uh, uh, global brain, and all these things that happen. Yes, of course, we have lots of things coming up, and lots of threats, and lots of opportunities. They already arrived, nanotechnologies, uh, cyborgs, you know, all these things. However, I invite you and I invite us to see the future as a piece of art, as a piece of self-creation. We can write code. I can rewrite my way to eat. I can completely rewrite the agreements, the social agreements I, I live by. I can hack myself. I can change my social codes. I can evolve my language. You can evolve your language. Everyone can do that. 
So we have so many arenas where we can, where we can play, where we can redesign ourselves following this arrow of evolution. And you really may want to take it more as a piece of art rather than just reacting to the world. Like, oh, I gotta do this, otherwise I won't survive. Don't go there for a survival thing. Go there, go there as humanonauts, as artists really creating the new reality. I, I really want to stress that because if I would not do that in my life, I would have a, a miserable life here. And the last thing, as you've noticed, it happens in the body all the time. You change language, language structures, we have them in our brain, in our body. That means you will, you will have to go into very deep questioning of the collective that operates through you and your flesh. You change food. I mean, most people I hear, 99.9% .9 of people I hear say, well, I know I would like to change, but it's so hard, so hard to change. I, I don't feel like going there. I would like the world there, but I, don't, I personally don't feel like going there. And I don't say you should, but at least let's have the honesty, individual honesty, to explore what kind of resistance we may have. What kind of resistance? And not become judgmental about it, because we don't want to fall into some kind of ideation of ourselves, you know, like a conceptual self that does not exist yet, and then we, we pursue that illusion all the time and we become unhappy beings. But at least just have this, this uh, sense of what we may resist and how maybe we can overcome that if we, if we want it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. So I'd like to become aware of, of time, and if we want to have some, uh, some questions, we have uh, five more minutes. Uh, so if you want to raise hands. And Jesus, can you, can you see who wants to speak? So, because I may make mistakes in the, yes, thank you. Eh, muchas gracias por la presentación. Me gustaría que hicieras algún comentario acerca de lo que has empezado en el último momento, de el cuerpo mm. como, como línea o como herramienta o como vía para toda esa transformación de los últimos tres puntos que has comentado. Mm. Just to make sure I understand your, your question, you mean what you think we should do or, so I'm not sure I, I get your, your question here. Um, yeah. Has dit, eh, estabas hablando del cuerpo al mm. final, mm -hmm. cuando estabas hablando de los tres aspectos, mm. si sí. yo he entendido bien, hablabas de, de construir el futuro, estabas mm. hablando mm. De, la, de lo espiritual, sí. y me gustaría la conexión del cuerpo mm. con esos dos aspectos. You see, for instance, social codes teach us how to breathe. And we breathe in a, in a very, very tense way for the most part. Just take that example. Evolve breathing. And, that, and so that means evolve the social codes of breathing that take place in your, in your body. And then your whole consciousness will evolve. An example. Also, what we do in the conventional world, we walk, we sit, we drive, we sleep, that makes uh, maybe less than 12 kinds of moves that we do, over thousands of different moves. Why don't we learn also how to reconquer all these possible moves through yoga, through martial arts, through stunts, if you, <laughs> if you want? I mean, so many ways, but at least, you know, for instance, at school, in the School of Pyramidal Collective Intelligence, we don't learn how to fall. We will fall in our life. We will fall from a bike, we will fall from a stairway, we will fall on the ice, on snow. Why don't we learn how to fall? Why do we learn how to disconnect ourselves from the floor? At a certain age, we lose half of our perception. I see most people, they walk like something on the floor, they will walk on it because they don't see it. We lose our 3D perception. So we lose our wholeness because of education. That 
says, what we lose and what we can reconquer all the time. How can we, you know, one of the reasons why I decided to, sit, to do something kind of silly here on stage also came for this reason. I wanted to break the social codes of a conference. I mean, who receives, you know, punches in the belly in a conference, right? <laughs> okay, so let's go wild. I, I don't want to just live by this, by this code. So it also comes with a level of permission that we can, uh, we can do. Another example, most of, most of the year, except winter, I walk, I walk barefoot. In, in cities, in New York, in India, in my, in my uh, home city, in uh, Aix-en-Provence in France, I walk barefoot. So I have, again, this connection with, uh, with the world, with the land. I ha when I walk, I have to walk consciously because you have lots of things on the, on the ground. So I practice this, uh, this connection. That gives me also another way to walk because if you walk naturally, then you will put the tip of the, of the foot before. Not that part, but the front part, because you want to test what happens. So you, you work like this, and then the, that opens the hips, and that frees the whole body. Y so you see, we have so many social codes and belief systems grounded, embedded in the body. So I, I hope I share a few examples. My pleasure. Anyone else? Okay, maybe we feel perfect for... Ah. So one last question, maybe, in the back. <laughs> I mean, why I really invite you to, to listen to the first conference I gave uh, a couple of months ago, because you will really connect the dot. I have a little bit of the feeling that sometimes I went too fast in this conference, if you have not listened to the previous conference, but it also came as the, as the agreement that I would not repeat the same conference. Please. Sí. Eh, una pregunta. Eh, cuando has explicado el término de holoviral, a mí me ha surgido un modelo de empresa creada por intraemprendedores. ¿Te refieres a esto? ¿Que podría ser ese un modelo? ¿Que desapareciera la relación eh, jefe-empleado para empezar a crear modelos en que todos somos jefes o todos somos empleados, mm. pero todos siendo responsables de nuestra seguridad social, nuestro sueldo, nuestros objetivos, nuestros proyectos? Today, more and more big organizations want to create more and more connection uh, and to change that hierarchical structure because they know it hurts them. In many organizations, people suffer, in big organizations, people suffer because they have two opposite uh, injunctions, you know, one says uh, become autonomous, become creative, have initiative and, uh, you know, invent new possibilities and connect with people. So on one side and on the other side they say, it says, well, obey to the hierarchy because you still have a command and control structure. So mo many structures, first, the first step, they, they try to create connection between people and to become more connected organizations. And then you see more and more organizations that try to become what we call agile organizations, learning organizations. You also have uh, new um, technologies or, or new um, ways to take decisions uh, like holacracy, for instance, or sociocracy. Lots and lots of tools happen here. And we see more and more companies evolving in the direction you, you said. However, they still keep the same old DNA. They still operate with the same language. They still operate with money. That means concentration of power, no matter what. They still operate, in most cases, with most of the same social codes and so on. So I say, when I see those companies, it makes a good step. What they do, please do that, do that. You know, evolve this way, become a learning, agile organization. Please do that. Try to remove the top-down thing and, and go into more like a leadership-based kind of organization where I can become a leader for something, you become a leader for some, something else, and we have a, a turning leadership. And you have more and more organizations doing that. However, I see that as the first step. The next step, you know, in the holomidal world, we may even question, will we have companies? I don't think so. I think we will have networks of people doing something for one project and another network of people 
doing something for another project, and you will belong as a person, you will connect yourself to as many projects as you may like, and some of them with your competency, maybe as a coach, and another one because you, you work in a network of stamp collectors, and you want to play there, and another network where you do something about uh, global education. We already start to do that, but this will happen more and more. And maybe also the law, as we know it, that defines a company with you know, how you work and salaries and, and, and taxes and all these things, they will probably vanish all these things. We don't need this stuff anymore. So when we look at how holomidal organizations operate, most of them don't even have a name. They don't have a legal existence. They don't have a location. They don't have a CEO. They don't ha have nothing that we can identify by the old standards of pyramidal collective intelligence. And I think it will really go this direction, and especially when holomidal collective intelligence will have invented post-monetary technologies. I work on those things, and I see they will happen very, very soon, sooner than what we think. I hope I, I nourished your, your question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one how do we do with time? You decide. Time. Una pregunta más, sí, okay. Eh, gracias por la conferencia. Ha sido un placer escucharte. Yo me pregunto, has hablado de comida, de, de normas sociales, eh, de lenguaje, pero quizá para conseguir este cambio, llegar a donde lo, lo que tú comentas, eh, no has hablado en ningún momento a nivel conciencia. Quizá sería necesario un cambio de conciencia, partiendo de la idea de que no somos individuos, sino que formamos parte de un grupo. Gracias. Maybe one of the, of the most important things that I learned in all these years of research and development comes from the chicken and egg story. We can say, if I evolve my consciousness, then I will evolve my actions. I will eat differently, I will di behave differently with my colleagues, I, maybe I will do a different job, uh, I will spend money differently, I will buy differently, I'll speak differently with my neighbors and my husband and my family and so on. So, from that shift, I can unfold a new manifestation, a new being, uh, a new manifested being. I also observed another thing which most people don't think about, what I call invisible architecture. If you go in a place where we change the architecture, let's say we decide new agreements, we, we eat new food, we speak differently. You agree, for instance, you won't, sp you won't use the verb to be for a week. You, you will eat differently for a week. We will make decisions in a different way for a week. And then people start to have consciousness experiences from that. So the freedom that we have all the time, every, every one of us, we can design special spaces where we, we design new invisible architectures. Let's agree that we will speak upon these and these rules and we'll learn, we'll train, of course. And let's uh, agree that we will play by new social codes. Let's agree that we'll eat this way. Let's agree that we'll do things with our body in a very different way. And then people start to have like expansion of consciousness because of the architecture. I've seen that so many times and sometimes in the most conventional corporate world, having corporate, peop corporate people coming and just doing those things. And then like two days, three days after, like they, they, they see themselves as complete strangers. Like, did I say that? Did I? And, and they, they cry and they, they have, you know, super emotional moments, like beautiful moments, like, like freedom. These kinds of things. So we have this freedom for, for that. And I really invite every one of us in, in this room to explore these possibilities. So thank you very much. Una pregunta más, sí. Gracias. Jean-François, gracias por tu conferencia. Hablando de códigos sociales, mencionabas desde la ontología redefinir, por ejemplo, el amor, pasar de el vector a pensarlo como un estado del ser. Eh, me hacía acordar a Benedetti que dice, me gusta el ser que soy cuando estoy a tu lado, y así define al amor. Y nos hablaste de la cortesía, como nosotros trabajamos muy ligados a las emociones. Eh, ¿Nos podrías regalar alguna otra distinción que has hecho de otras reinterpretaciones de las emociones? ¿Algún otro ejemplo? 
aparte del amor. ¿En la ontología, en el lenguaje? Sí. Uh -huh. um, two examples that go together, what I call in English thingification. Thingification, when we transform something as a thing. For instance, meat. If I say meat, I eat meat, I've transformed the whole experience of animals, living beings, hunters, killers, slaughters, you know, butcher, market, whatever, into meat, meat. I, I just see like a, this like a, a cookie or a stone or something as an object. So, and we have so many things like that where we thingify uh, when we talk about numbers or in people also, we thingify them uh, a lot. So, thingification. Um, the other example, uh, when we say the French, the terrorists, the Spanish, the, um, the homeless. When I name this category, let's say I see you in the street and then I see my friend and I say, oh, I saw homeless, he asked me for money. Well, I create a category of you only as a homeless. I have reduced you into a category. I can't put in my mind that maybe you know how to play the piano, maybe you have kids, maybe you have so many other qualities, maybe you had another life. You know, maybe you, you, you know how to speak different languages. No, a homeless can't do this thing. A homeless just becomes a homeless. So that means this categorization of, of people that really reduces that. So I try to, in order to change that, to hack that, I would say maybe a homeless person. So it stresses on the person first, which creates a much wider category because the person has much more potential and that has the status of a homeless. I would use things like that. Does that feed your, your question? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, thank you.